and welcome to the Hypermobility Happy Hour, the first podcast completely dedicated to discussing all topics related to hypermobility disorders, including hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only, and not for the diagnosis or treatment of any one individual. Please work with a trusted physician when making changes to your own treatment protocol. Today, we have a fascinating guest on our show, Dr. Tanya Dempsey, an expert in chronic disease, autoimmune disorders, endocrinology, and mast cell activation syndrome. Dr. Dempsey is sought after internationally for her knowledge of chronic immune dysregulation and has attracted patients from all over the world. Dr. Dempsey utilizes integrative medicine to get to the patient's root cause of their illness. Dr. Dempsey is also a co-author on the recent article in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology entitled Successful Mast Cell Targeted Treatment of Chronic Dyspareunia, Vaginitis, and Dysfunctional Uterine Bleeding. Dr. Dempsey received her medical degree from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and her Bachelor of Science degree from Cornell University. She completed her residency at NYU Medical Center, Bellevue Hospital, and then served as an attending physician at a large multi-specialty medical practice in White Plains, New York, before opening Armonk Integrative Medicine. Dr. Dempsey is a member of the Institute for Functional Medicine and the American College of Physicians and holds a certificate in Vanguard Endocrinology. Dr. Dempsey is board certified in internal medicine and is a diplomat of the American Board of Integrative and Holistic Medicine. Dr. Dempsey, hello. Hello. Hi, we're so thrilled to have you on the podcast today. And today we would like to focus on the endocrine system, which for our listeners is the collection of glands that produces hormones that regulate metabolism, growth and development, tissue function, sexual function, reproduction, sleep and mood, among other things. And we want to talk specifically about how this system relates to hypermobility disorders. And in particular, we're going to talk about how these disorders can impact gynecologic issues. And we're eager to dive right in and um, talk with Dr. Dempsey about this. Um, Dr. Dempsey, we know that patients come to you from all over the world. And can you fill us in a little bit about um, the people who seek your assistance? Like what kind of conditions are they coming to you with? Uh, you know, I would say that uh, these are patients with complex multi-system diseases. They've seen numerous um, doctors and practitioners of all kinds, um, and they've been given lots of different diagnoses, but but no really unifying diagnosis and not really an understanding of the root cause. Um, and so, um, you know, I'll... Uh, I'll look at, I mean, we could talk more about, you know, my approach uh, and what I do for these patients, but I would say that um, many of these patients um, have uh, as the root cause uh, things like mast cell activation syndrome, um, autoimmunity um, that's been undetected. They have um, infections uh, that chronic smoldering, um, persistent infections um, that sometimes they're aware of and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're tick-borne diseases, but not necessarily. Um, They often have uh, gastrointestinal issues um, and and gastrointestinal infections and parasites, and they have toxin exposures. And and so, yeah, it's really complicated. Um, Really, every system is often affected. And uh, and we need to figure out how everything is related. Sure, that that make that makes sense. And and looking for the root cause is is certainly a much better approach than what I think people are used to in more traditional many traditional practices where it's kind of a band aid here, band aid there kind of a thing. So exactly, absolutely. And that was such a great um, overview. Thank you. Um, could you please describe, I guess, in a nutshell, your approach to the evaluation and treatment of these complex patients? Sure. I think, well, so number one, um, getting the clinical history is, um, is imperative, right? So I start the history taking even before the patient is born. So in other words, I want the patient to go back and tell me about the health of their mother and the, the pregnancy and the delivery, even if I'm dealing with a patient who's, you know, it, it, you know, uh, 50, 60, 70, it doesn't matter um, because everything sort of starts there. Um, and you learn a little bit about genetics that way. And you also learn about epigenetics that way. I understand 
um, what the patient was exposed to. I understand if they were breastfed and that, that affects the immune system. And so I get this very thorough history all the way from, from the beginning to, to, till, till when they're sitting in front of me. Um, and then, um, based on that history and based on my exam and we start, I start, you know, talking about what, how we're going to get the answers and what kind of testing do we need? I cast a fairly wide net, meaning that um, I, I am pretty comprehensive in the testing that I do. Um, but, but of course, it's based on their history. So I'm looking at multiple ways. I'm looking at their immune system. I'm looking at their hormones. And I know we're going to talk a lot about hormones, but um, there's no question that all the different uh, organs in the endocrine system impact the immune system impact the other organ systems. And so you got to look, I have to look at everything. And so I'll, I'll look at their hormones. I'll look at their, um, I'll look to see if they've been exposed to any infections. I'll look and see if they have any toxin exposures, again, depending on their history. But, but what I find more often than not is that we, once you, if you approach it correctly, um, you will get the answer. And actually, the harder part is really the treatment, um, because that has to be very personalized, individualized, and and every body reacts differently to different treatments. And so that's where um, that's the that's the hardest part of what what I, what I do. Um, and what's interesting to me is that I often get the answers. It's surprising to me that others haven't been able to find the answers. But again, that's only that's only like a small piece of what then has to happen. Sure. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Ultimately it's about getting the patients better. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you are um, so well known for your expertise in, in so many different areas um, and gynecologic issues and challenges, you know, definitely being, being one of them, especially in patients with hypermobility disorders. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the uh, biggest challenges are that this population faces when it comes to gynecologic problems in, in particular and what can be done about them? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it seems that um, at the start of uh, puberty is when many of these women start to really notice the impact on uh, of their hypermobility. And, you know, it's not a coincidence that things get worse around puberty. And that's because the hormones start to uh, rage and um, and sometimes often uh, irregularly in the beginning, and these fluctuations in hormones, um, either the good fluctuations we, we consider normal or or bad fluctuations we would consider abnormal, and so the periods are irregular. It doesn't matter at the end of the day, um, the hormones will will impact um, the the joints um, and the connective tissue and um, and the immune system and all these other things that are connected. Um, and so a lot of patients with um, hypermobility find that before their period, particularly between ovulation and when they actually start menstruating, um, that may be the, the peak time when their, um, their joints are a little bit more uh, vulnerable to dislocating. They may, they get loose everything gets looser at that time. And that's where, um, that's, those are things that, um, women have to think about. You know, I take care of a number of, um, uh, women athletes and, um, they know that, uh, if they're training very hard before their period, um, they may be at risk for injury. And so, um, you know, they have to maybe change their, their training program during that time. It doesn't mean they have to stop doing everything, right? It just means that they have to be more aware. Um, so I think that, um, so the challenges are that obviously women menstruate every month normally. And so this is something that is going to affect women on a monthly basis, right? Mm -hmm. um, for some women, uh, irregular periods are actually quite common in this population, which which will compound the, the problem. And um, and ovarian cysts, also quite uh, common, endometriosis as well we see, um, and that can be painful and uh, uncomfortable and is driven by high levels of estrogen. So we know that high levels of estrogen can cause the development of cysts. We know that um, low levels of progesterone can, can cause increased bleeding. We know high levels of progesterone can cause more laxity in the, in the connective tissue. And so 
it's sort of like a, I hate to say it, lose-lose situation because, because some of my patients will say, well, if this is causing the problem, let's correct it. You know, let's just give like a pill, uh, a birth control pill and try to stabilize it. And sometimes that works because it does stabilize the hormones and sometimes it backfires because ultimately it's still a hormone and some patients are very, very, um, you know, sensitive. So, um, so it is challenging. Do you think that these hormonal shifts that, that women, certainly that this is ex- something that females will experience and males don't, do you think that that's something that helps to explain at least in part why so many more females are affected by hypermobility disorders than males? Yeah, I, I think it does. And I would venture to guess, I mean, it's a guess because I, I don't have data on this, that um, men who have um, hypermobility or, or boys, let's say, um, that, that are starting to show signs of it, um, they may have, let's say, lower levels of testosterone. They may have higher levels of estrogen because, because women have some, estrogen, some, some testosterone and a lot of estrogen and men have like a little bit of estrogen and a lot of testosterone. But if that balance is, is changed and that is often uh, could be genetic, could be environmental. There are lots of reasons. I would, I venture, I'm venturing to guess, and I could be completely wrong here, that some of the men who get it probably have an imbalance between their testosterone and estrogen. And Dr. Dempsey, you mentioned ovarian cysts. And I think this is something that there's a lot of confusion about because some ovarian cysts, at least my understanding, is that some ovarian cysts are, are quite innocent and others can be quite problematic. So would you be able to give us a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, many patients who have hypermobility also have another condition called mast cell activation syndrome. And um, I, you know, the way we think about it is that uh, mast cells, which are involved in the immune system, um, are probably driving some of the hypermobility in the connective tissue. And that's a that's a complex way that I'm, I'm thinking about it, and I don't know if your if your patients are, uh, or if your followers are aware of mast cell activation syndrome, but you know basically it's um, it's an abnormal response of the immune system, particularly these mast cells, to what what it thinks is foreign to it, but but probably isn't um, always, and uh, releases these um, chemicals, histamine. Chromogranin A, tryptase. There are a number of different chemicals that the that the mast cell releases, and the way I think about it, if these mast cells are releasing their chemicals in the joints in the connective tissue, um, they're they're causing a change in that connective tissue, and um, and altering it. Right. So now it may not be as strong. May now it may be sure. looser, and whatever ma- whatever they can do at the level of the connective tissue, they could do elsewhere. So mast cells can affect what I what I call abnormal growth and development, which means that the mast cells can drive uh, the development of, of cysts and nodules and different growths that may be maybe benign, maybe malignant. Um, but there's, it's, there's, there is evidence to show that that mast cells may be a, a driver for that. So, so what I, what I'm seeing is that many of the patients with hypermobility have some aspect of mast cell activation syndrome, not all, but I would say a vast majority. Um, and, and because of that underlying mast cell activation syndrome, they are at risk for other things. And so, um, ovarian cysts tend to be very much associated with mast cell activation syndrome um, from a, because of a variety of, of reasons. Um, number one, mast cells have estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, testosterone receptors on the surface of them. So they can react if estrogen binds it or progesterone binds it. And so they're reacting to um, whatever is uh, is happening. So if the estrogen levels are going up or down or progesterone, right, the mast cells may react, and that may be driving some of the symptomatology we're seeing, um, like the development of cysts in particular. Um, and and so I think that just and we can talk more about um, irregular periods because I think that that's actually an interesting uh, segue from here, but. As far as ovarian cysts, there are um, there are cysts that are associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome, 
And those those women can have um, small, benign cysts that go come and go and are fine. And sometimes they can grow very large and rupture and cause a problem. And there is a link between polycystic ovarian syndrome and hypermobility and mast cell activation syndrome. And and in polycystic ovarian syndrome, there's an abnormal there's an there's a yeah abnormal balance of um, of hormones, and there tends to be too much testosterone, uh, also very high levels of estrogen, and not enough progesterone, and that is probably driving some of the production of um, of these ovarian cysts. Um, there are there are other reasons cysts can form, and there are certainly um, some autoimmune reasons. And there there are women who do not have polycystic ovarian syndrome and and get cysts, so it's complicated. But I think that generally the the driver of this looks to be um, hormone um, causing an abnormality in the mast cell reactivity. Um, and then even going further down to the root cause, I would say that it's important to note that um, cysts are also driven by diet and, and really? sugar That's in particular. And so insulin um, is produced when you eat a lot of sugar. And uh, it seems that insulin uh, can, insulin and sugar together sort of um, cause uh, these uh, abnormalities and, and can lead to the development. That's fascinating. So so can people, by changing their diet, ha- influence the development of these things? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, diet is very challenging because some, some of these patients are very sensitive um, and they're sensitive to foods and they're sensitive to, to medications. And, and so it is challenging. You have to find the right diet for each patient. But I would say, generally speaking, across the board, um, lower carbohydrate, carbohydrates in general in their diet is going to be better um, because carbohydrates are what's driving, you know, basically the, that turns to sugar and that drives the insulin. So, um, so I am a, you know, big believer in low carbohydrate diets, ketogenic diets, um, and I'll go so far as to say carnivore diets, but that's a whole other <laughs> That would make a great follow-up episode, <laughs> especially given you and I had some excellent conversations about this at the Mass Cell Conference in April, and, and, I, and I happen to be currently pescatarian, so I feel like you and I could have a great conversation about that. <laughs> Yeah, let's be, do it. Really let's fun. do it. It'll, It'll be, be fun. very, very interesting. <laughs> um, and, and you mentioned a couple of times about irregular periods, and that's something that I definitely see also, you know, yeah. in my patient population. Is there anything else that our listeners should be aware of um, when it comes to things like irregular menstrual cycles? Uh, you know, so the the issue with the irregularity is that I mean, there are a lot of issues with it, but um, if um, if your symptoms are, if you're not able to track your symptoms based on your period, then it becomes very difficult, right? So I have, I have, you know, young, let's say adolescents, teenagers who um, are, are irregular and they're irregular maybe because of their age or irregular because they have polycystic ovarian syndrome and they're going to be irregular. And they start, they start feeling, they start feeling not well. Um, their joints start bothering them more. They have more pain. And, and then, you know, you're trying to figure out if it's due to the fact that their hormones are changing or if there's something else going on. And that's the challenge, right? They don't always know if their period is coming or not. Um, and many of them don't ovulate regularly um, and sometimes don't ovulate at all. So it's very hard to track. So their hormones are going up and down and, um, and driving them crazy, uh, ultimately. Um, so it is, it is a challenge and it has to be addressed. And um, I think that there are a subset of patients that will respond to um, oral contraceptive pills um, at the right dosage, the right kind. You know, sometimes it's trial and error, and it's not the wrong answer. It just has to be really um, specific for the patient. I will really not feel comfortable putting a patient on uh, oral contraceptive pills if there's a family history of blood clots and heart issues and things like that. Then I'm a little more fearful. I'm going to want to. I'm going to want to try a different way. Um, I know that um, some gynecologists are using IUDs, certain types of IUDs that produce a little progesterone, um, very, very low dose progesterone. And some of my hypermobile patients seem to be do okay with that, even though there's a little progesterone there. Um, and, and then sometimes you just have to, I mean, there are other, probably other things to discuss, but, but ultimately it's, um, 
I like to get to the root. Um, and if it's polycystic ovarian syndrome, then I'm going to work on their diet and I'm going to work on their insulin resistance, either with medication or supplements or and, and diet. Um, and sometimes, believe it or not, that is enough, um, especially if they reduce their insulin levels and become more sensitive, insulin sensitive. But um, sometimes um, you have to attack it from the mast cell perspective. And uh, because if I think that the mast cells are somehow interfering with the cycle, which I think it does often, sometimes I'm treating that. And um, I've had patients who've had, um, I have a patient, for instance, who has polycystic ovarian syndrome, has very, very irregular periods. She's in her 30s. And, um, and in between the periods, she started bleeding a lot. And, um, you know, and so she was First she was spotting, and then it was like a true, true bleeding, but not that's not her period. It just was happening um, completely randomly. So um, we wound up treating her very simply with some Claritin and Pepsid, which is an H1, H2 blocker, which works very well for mast cell activation syndrome. It doesn't always work this well, but literally within two or three months, she stopped bleeding intermittently and her period started to become a little more regular. It wasn't, it wasn't miraculously regular, but it was better. And she stopped the, the bleeding in between. So, um, so I think that this is uh, this is complex and for each patient you have to sort of attack it, you know, a little bit differently. Wow. Yeah, that was incredibly helpful and a very useful overview. Thank you so much. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the role of hormones in hypermobility disorders so far, but could you give us kind of a general high-level overview of how the different hormones like testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone impact the symptoms that people with hypermobility disorders may end up experiencing? Sure. Um, you know, I think, so what I'll say is this, um, that there's some general ideas of what each hormone does, but um, I'll, I'll counter it and say that you could almost sometimes see the opposite in some ways. So, so for instance, um, there's some, some people talking in the EDS community about um, estrogen, using estrogen instead of progesterone, um, and, um, and that may be better, and I'll explain why. Progesterone um, does seem to um, cause more instability in the joints, uh, more laxity in the, in the connective tissue. And so the concern is if you give these patients too much progesterone, uh, let's say in, in a pill form, that that may impact them negatively. So countering it with estrogen might be better. Um, and the thought is that estrogen may be, may be stabilizes things. I'm not so sure about that because estrogen also causes more ovarian cysts and other issues. And so again, like nothing is written in stone as far as I'm concerned. All everything has, has a, a positive and a negative effect. Okay. So progesterone, you know, is bad, but, but on the flip side, uh, progesterone, um, not enough progesterone causes these women to bleed a lot and have abnormal uh, uterine bleeding. They, um, not enough progesterone can, can increase anxiety, can increase mood disorders. So having some progesterone tends to, to balance that out. So again, good and bad on all sides. Um, testosterone. So depends how you look at it. So in women, um, if they have too much testosterone and they have polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, that's a bad thing for a variety of reasons. Um, they tend to have issues with their weight, hair loss, hair hairiness um, on their face, on their body, um, and that interferes with the, the estrogen and progesterone cycling, so they get irregular periods. Um, but test testosterone may be more stabilizing um, for the connective tissue. So it's, um, everything is, um, yeah, like a double-edged sword, so to speak. Wow. So the relationships are really complex because it sounds like it can also be problematic if you don't have enough, for example, testosterone also. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Wow. It's very important. Yeah. It's very important. It's an important hormone. There's no question. You just have to have the right amount. Right. And then how do you get, how do you get the right amount that doesn't cause one problem and helps the other? Right. Right. Exactly. Um, and as we touched on earlier, um, we know that many more females are affected by hypermobility disorders than males, although certainly there are males that have both 
uh, you know, things like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. There are males that have uh, mast cell activation and, you know, things like postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, et cetera, all, all of these kind of related conditions, right? And, but, right. but the gynecologic care piece of that, um, what do you think are the biggest challenges and barriers for, for uh, women um, to getting adequate gynecologic care? Well, the challenge is really, um, because, well, there's so many challenges. Uh, I think that there's not enough um, knowledge in the gynecologic community um, about EDS. And so really education is, is critical. Um, there are some excellent, uh, gynecologists out there and gynecologists obst obstetricians, but, um, they are not necessarily aware of this or they know about hypermobility. I mean, they see patients who are hypermobile, but they don't understand how it's impacting everything else. So, so, you know, I'm all for education. I know you are because you have this excellent podcast that you're doing and it's incredible. And that's how you get the word out. Um, and you hope that um, patients listen to this and pass it on to their doctors um, so they, they can learn more. Um, you know, it's, it, we try to publish and I published um, this article with, um, with my colleagues um, and on, on this um, you know, issue surrounding gynecologic issues and mast cell activation syndrome. So, you know, I have patients who are printing out that article and bringing it to their gynecologist. Um, so I think, um, so I don't know what the right answer is. I, for me, it's about education, and it's a, unfortunately, it's now up to the patients to help educate the doctors, and that's that's an unfortunate place for patients to be. They're they're suffering, they don't feel well, but they're they have to advocate for themselves because selves because they don't you know they don't have a choice, and uh, they're the ones that are sort of moving this along, which is remarkable, but that's that's what's happening. Totally. Yes, uh, absolutely. I 100% agree with those sentiments. Um, and uh, switching gears a little bit, though, but could you tell us a little bit um, about pregnancy and EDS, um, like the obstetric considerations for patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and other hypermobility disorders? Yeah. So, you know, I'll just preface this by saying that I'm not an obstetrician, right? So I, the last time I took care of a, a pregnant woman was myself, I don't know, uh, 17 years ago or whatever. So, um, uh, I, so I don't, I don't routinely care for patients during their pregnancy. Um, but, but what we do know is that, um, during pregnancy, there are high level, there's a very high level of progesterone. Um, and that is really supporting the, the uterus and supporting the womb, um, so that the baby can, can develop, the embryo can develop. Uh, but um, those high progesterone levels cause uh, more laxity uh, and more stretchiness to the to the ligaments, and so it's not uncommon for um, patients to have issues with their joints uh, during during pregnancy, um, dislocating joints, uh, particularly even during delivery. This is this is this could be um, a real problem. They're more prone to tearing. Um, so let's say, um, if they're delivering vaginally, again, their tissue is, is maybe a little bit, um, more friable or, or that's not even the right word. I think it's just that they're, yeah, there's a stretchiness to the, to the skin, um, and, and the skin, um, including as a connective tissue. And so, um, they can, they can tear, um, if they don't do an episiotomy the right way, they may have trouble healing after episiotomies or C-sections. They may be more at risk for getting, um, the diastasis recti, which is the separation of the muscles of the abdomen. They sort of pull, uh, pull towards the side. And so some women find that after they've had the baby, after they've lost mm -hmm. the weight, they still have this like pouch <laughs> that sticks out. Um, and it's really um, basically like the inside sticking out, um, terminating through because the muscles are stretchy and have stretched out and have not recovered well because of their underlying uh, condition. Sure. That makes, that makes sense that uh, those, those complications could be more, more prevalent in this, in this population. And could you tell our listeners where they can find you in particular? Okay, of course. So, um, yeah, so for me, um, my website, uh, www.drdrtanyademsey.com. 
Um, I have a Facebook page, Dr. Tanya Dempsey. Um, we're doing, we do a lot of Facebook live events and webinars and, um, and do a lot of education and blog posts on various topics related to uh, cell activation syndrome, EDS, and many of the other things that I treat. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much um, for your insights. And this has been such a great conversation. I've learned so much and we could go on and we hopefully will be able to um, have you on uh, for our future episodes because there's so much more we could discuss. But we have one last question that we ask to all of our guests. If you could wave a magic wand today and make one thing better for patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, what would it be? Oh, well, if we could get rid of the joint pain, right? I mean, pain, if we could just do that, I mean, that that would be life-changing for so many patients, um, EDS and non-EDS patients, right? Pain is probably is a driver of so much um, despair and it's horrible. Yeah, that was, that's what I would do. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And and I, I definitely would echo that uh, in my practice and, and everything that that's such a huge problem for so many, for so many folks, and especially in our current uh, culture and everything. So, well, it's been wonderful having you on the podcast today, Dr. Dempsey. We just are so grateful to you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us. Um, in particular, these hormonal, gynecologic, you know, endocrine, uh, and the way they interface with the mast cell is, is such a complicated, and I think uh, not super well understood, uh, t- you know, type of situation. So I, hopefully we will learn a lot more about this in the next number of years so that, you know, five years from now, we can have a, a, a completely uh, more detailed, in-depth conversation that will be really able to help a lot of people. And um, this has been really great. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Happy to, to be here talking and and educating and and be happy to come back again. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks for joining us on this episode of the Hypermobility Happy Hour. We'll catch you next time. Bye. Hypermobility Happy Hour is a collaboration from Dr. Linda Bluestein and Carrie Gabrielson. The Hypermobility Happy Hour is produced by Dan Gabrielson. The music is by Sarah Giusti. Hypermobility disorders are complex and can be difficult to diagnose and treat. Information shared on this podcast may not apply to your specific condition, and this podcast is not intended to be a substitute or serve as any form of medical treatment. Talk with your physician to discuss which treatments might be right for you. Thanks.